So to discuss youth, um, I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the approach to youth, and this is going to be a very basic gloss over this. But I think the most important point about addressing youth, and this is something that um, Dr. Bakking uh, touched on, is if we can identify youth at a prepubertal or pubertal age, we can prevent the virilization and the progress of their natal puberty. We can avoid a lot of the undoing that has to happen in the medical, in the, in the doctor's office if the patient presents as an adult. And we can reduce trauma associated with living in the wrong gender and body, and it will allow socialization and development potentially at the same time and pace as their peers, which really can have a profound effect on development. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so the general approach is a provider would work with uh, child, family, school, uh, other stakeholders, whomever that might be. It could be clergy, it could be extended family members, friends, whatever it is. And uh, the role of mental health is central to uh, this process, a mental health provider, ideally who has experience with transgender youth issues, should be involved. And putting all of these folks together, some decisions can be arrived at as to what would the process be moving forward. Do we allow the child to cross-dress at home only? Do we allow them to maybe dress in their preferred clothing on weekends when they go out of the house to dinner but not to school? Or do we allow them to socially transition? Do we allow the child, prepubertal child, to go to school dressed as the gender that they prefer? Um, and then once the child arrives at puberty in general, and this is very, very basic level here, but in general, when the child arrives at puberty 10 or stage 2, we feel that that child has experienced enough of their natal gender to, at that point, we feel comfortable if the child is still exhibiting cross-gender feelings and desires, that that is the time to consider a medical intervention. And so medical interventions available are to give a puberty blocker, which would be used for several years, that could, up to several years, that will arrest the process of puberty while other issues come into play. So perhaps there's a parent who has some concerns. Perhaps both parents are supportive of progressing with a hormonal transition but are waiting to move to another neighborhood or waiting for the child to enter high school or any other of a number of issues. Uh, once puberty blockers, uh, once a time arrives that folks are ready to begin a social uh, hormonal transition, um, cross-gender hormone treatment can be begun. Sometimes this can be begun without a course of puberty blockers, depending on the overall circumstances. And uh, surgery uh, is generally not done in youth. There have been a couple of cases reported in the media and in the literature, but surgery at this point for those who are interested is, is in general delayed until the age of majority. We can go to the next slide. And so, as I mentioned, this really allows children to progress in the chosen gender. And it, these are just some other specifics of hormone care. Again, I don't want to get too into that. We can go to the next slide. So cancer risk and screening, I'm just going to put these up here and just mention that they exist. There's something that we need to think about. There's really limited data on the screening and the long-term risk uh, for all of these conditions. These are things that we have to think about. We can go to the next slide. Uh, great. So this is a review article that was published um, in 2008, it was review of the literature, and they basically reported, and this is from a group from the Netherlands who's the leader in transgender research, and there are so far in a few cases of hormone-related cancer and transsexuals. Um, I want to point out that so far endometrial cancer, as of this time, had not been encountered since then. There has been one case in the literature of endometrial cancer, but that, that notwithstanding, this says one of two things. It really says two things to me. One, it says there's not a lot of smoke, so there's probably not a big fire. So what this means is that there's probably not a lot of hormone-related cancer in transgender people, likely not more than the general population. What it also says is that we very well could be missing large swaths of the population in our studies, and there could be patients who are either not being detected and are dying of other conditions or dying undetected. Um, and so this is, again, a, a call for improved epidemiologic surveillance of this population. Um, we can go to the next slide. A general uh, dictum of preventive screening in transgender patients is if you have an organ, it must be screened, so we should take an organ inventory uh, of all of our patients and uh, determine which one, uh, which ones they have and how to screen for it. And something else that I'd like to point out from a research perspective is 
it's entirely possible that we might do research and find out that pelvic examinations on transgender men are not necessary at all. And this is looking at things from an outcome perspective. For example, the breast self-examination is now not recommended in most circumstances because it has not been found to improve outcomes. And so if we find that there's one or two case reports of endometrial cancer in the literature and we have um, transgender men who periodically present with some vaginal spotting, we might find that a workup with an ultrasound and or endometrial biopsy is, is not warranted and not, from a population health standpoint, affect outcomes. And that's important to look at in transgender people because a pelvic exam, a vaginal ultrasound is a much bigger deal to a transgender man in some circumstances than it might be in, in your general population of women in your practice. So just, again, thinking about transgender patients from a different perspective and thinking about some of the psychosocial issues that are wrapped around their medical care. We can go to the next slide. So some of the long-term considerations, I'm just going to put this citation here just so that you have it. This is a large population, a couple of thousand patients from the Netherlands. Mortality was not higher in a comparison group, particularly after they switched to using uh, safer forms of estrogen, um, which had been uh, different from previous ones, which is where the risk of blood clots comes from, which is now that uh, we have new forms of estrogen is not as much of an issue. Can we go to the next slide, please? Quality of life outcomes, we know from uh, several recently published studies from Spain as well as here in the United States that hormone therapy reduces anxiety, depression, and improves social functioning. We've found that surgery includes, improves global functioning and quality of life. The regret rates are very low, and malpractice risk is effectively non-existent in, in caring for the population with respect to um, re regret. Um, the miscellaneous issues, uh, documentation is always something to think about as well as diagnostic coding. Um, I don't know that. I honestly think that we probably need to skip this slide and move forward in the interest of time. Uh, the future, we have this fantastic report from the Institute of Medicine, um, which tells us that we need to do research on LGBT people and transgender people. Next slide. Uh, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists this past December released a physician statement directing that specialty to prepare to care for transgender patients. This is groundbreaking. And I really hope that other professional societies follow suit. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, wrapping up with just some resources, the Center of Excellence Protocols, which I was uh, centrally involved in with the development, are, in my opinion, the number one resource for U.S. providers to turn to uh, for transgender guidance as kind of your first resource. Um, they are the most recent uh, evidence and expert opinion-based treatment protocols, and they are specifically tailored to U.S. healthcare issues. Um, other guidelines from Europe and Canada are, to be quite honest, focused on systems where some more resources may exist, and uh, these are focused on more resource-poor um, uh, settings, the use of protocols. We can go to the next slide. I'm just going to pass through a couple of other um, resources that are available here. The Hoover guidelines are a complete set of guidelines and are a great and more in-depth uh, set of guidelines. I'm not sure how applicable they are to a U.S. Um, setting. We can go to the next one. And just some additional references is a fantastic review. If you're looking for a quick eight-page read um, that really is very straightforward and makes sense and you want to find out how to take care of patients tomorrow morning, uh, this is a great place to start for transgender care. Next, next reference, please. And uh, this is a long-term outcome study by the group in the Netherlands, next reference, um, and some additional um, references, including a fantastic primer on adolescent patients, just five pages long from my colleagues at Children's Hospital. And we can go to the next uh, slide. This is my contact information, and um, I apologize for going slightly long, and uh, it's just uh, wonderful to be here as a transgender woman myself. I'm so proud to um, have this ability to help work with and improve the care and health of transgender people. Thank you very much.